Last week, we looked at who is and who is not a child of God and uh, went through a whole bunch of different things that doesn't make us a child of God and then a few things that we needed to do to become a child of God. And uh, this morning, I want for us to look at heaven's human occupants. This was what Diana read for us there, basically in Psalm 15, 1 through 5. David's elaborating uh, to at least a small degree of who's going to be able to go to heaven and who's not. You know, unless one repents uh, and asks Jesus to come into their life, they can't be a child of God and they can't go to heaven. It's, it's as simple, if you want to say it, it's as simple as that. And there's nothing hard about, uh, you know, asking, repenting and asking forgiveness. But I wonder how often do we think about who's going to be in heaven? You know, I think sometimes we think about, well, Grandma will be there and a friend of mine and some of these different people, and, and that's probably true. But, uh, you know, my thought is seeing some of the Bible characters will be there, but who's the first one, I believe, that we should at least want to see when we get there, and that's the Lord himself, right? After all he's done for us, we should want to see him first and foremost. We have a whole eternity to see some of these other folks that are there. But, you know, I don't think we consider very much about that, uh, who's going to be there and who isn't going to be there. But I think the following verses make it clear that obviously not everyone is going to be in heaven. You know, there's the philosophy that was going around, all roads lead to heaven, which is simply not true because there's only one road that leads to heaven, all the rest of the roads lead to hell. And uh, yet there's so many people that feel like they're going to be there simply because of whatever. But I want to look at some positive responses first and then some negative responses after that. But in, ver in uh, chapter of 15 of Psalm, David gives us some very clear, I believe, uh, description of who's going to be there. Verse 1 says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill? And then he goes on to answer that question. Verse 2 says, he who walks uprightly. Uprightly is, is basically blameless or uh, without reproach. Um, that kind of a person will be one that will be in heaven. Is that possible in today's world to walk uprightly and without reproach? And I believe the answer is yes, that we can if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. First of all, we have to be a Christian, don't we? We have to be a child of God. And then to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us, uh, we can live that lifestyle. But is it easy? <laughs> Not by a long shot. You know, even Jesus had his people trying to, to cause him all sorts of problems. But, uh, you know, too many times in the Bible, uh, two of many Bible illustrations that we have of somebody that walked upright. One, you probably all know, Enoch, back in uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch was one who walked with God, and God took him. And then Nathaniel in John 1, uh, 7, 47, John 1, 47, just the fact that can any good thing, uh, any good thing come out of out of uh, where Nathaniel lived, huh? Yeah, I think I think it was Nazareth. Anyhow, and, and Jesus said he couldn't couldn't find any problem with Nathaniel. So it can be done. Old Testament believers could do it. New Testament believers could do it. You and I can do it if we choose to do so. You know, some verses, and I'm not going to read these, but I'll just mention, and I think you have them in your outline there, uh, pertaining to the upright walk, or we walk in love, Ephesians 5.12. We walk circumspectly, Ephesians 5.15. We walk as children of light, Ephesians 5.8. And my question is, do these characterize each of 
our lives or these things that we do on a daily basis. Not on a Sunday. We need to do them then too, but throughout the week. One who walks uprightly, one who works righteously, verse 2 also says that. Uh, he who works righteousness. And the believer is to be engaged in righteous activities. When Jesus was here on earth, what, what was one of the things he said? He had to be about his father's business, which was doing the things that God had, had asked him to do, and he was doing that. Uh, walk, we're, we're doing works, righteous works. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we do that, then we'll be one of those who will be here that David's talking about. We'll dwell in his, ta in his tabernacle and in his holy hill, and we call it heaven today. But one who speaks truthfully, verse 2, it says, He who walks uprightly, who, who, he who works righteousness, he speaks the truth in his heart. God hates liars. He calls Satan the father of lies there in John chapter 8, verse 44. And he makes it clear that, I, I, you know, I, I really appreciate this, that sometimes people say, well, that's just a white lie or, a, you know, maybe a gray lie. But God makes it very clear in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, that all liars, doesn't matter what color, he doesn't say a, when he talks, there's a list of things there. He doesn't say, you know, a person that does a little of this or a little more of that or a little more of that or whatever else. But I like when he says, all liars shall have their place in the in the lake of fire. Not just, not just you know, we, sometimes you hear people try to pass off a lie as just a white lie. And there is no such thing as far as God is concerned with a white lie. As I thought about this, you know, lying may not only be verbal. Sometimes I think we think it is, don't we, that lying is verbal. But it's, it is that. But it's also the way we live our lifestyle. If we say we're a Christian and uh, don't live like one, isn't that lying? You know, it sure seems to me like it is. And uh, so we need not only to watch what we say, but we need to watch how we live. And one who speaks truthfully uh, doesn't lie. You know, God makes it clear that, again, no gray or white lies are going to be in heaven. While we lie, when we lie, we not only lie to the person, but we also lie to God. Did you know that? If, if you lie to someone or someone lies to you, they're not only lying to a person, but they're lying to God. Remember back in Acts chapter 5, I think it's verse 3, where all uh, oh, the two, two that... Ananias and Sapphira. So I'm glad I got you guys here to help me out. I'd be in trouble without that. Ananias and Sapphira both lied. And it's, he says right there in Acts chapter 5 that they lied to the Holy Spirit. Which says two things to me. The Holy Spirit is a person. And uh, when you lie, you lie to the Holy Spirit, not just to each other. Some positive responses. Walk uprightly. Work righteousness. Speak truthfully, and then some negative responses. One that doesn't backbite, he says there in verse 3, he who does not backbite with his tongue. You know anybody, and don't, don't raise your hands, anybody that backbites, you know, that, that says something about somebody else, whether they gossip or, you need this, you need, have you heard about this? A backbiter is one who talks about others, but not to their face. You know, they're not bold enough to say the things that they say to other people to their face. James had something to say about the tongue over in James chapter 3. Uh, let me just, I think we have time to read it. James chapter 3, I know it's here somewhere. Okay, James chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 10. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body 
and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and uh, creature and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless God and God the, and Father, and with it we curse men, who may have been made who have been made in the imi, in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. You know, it's sad, isn't it, when that happens, when people backbite against each other and, and talk negatively about another person. Uh, we may think nobody knows but the one that's hearing it, but God knows what's going on. One that doesn't backbite, one that doesn't do evil to others, also in verse 3, nor does evil to his neighbor. I don't know, can you get much clearer than that, saying about what it takes to get to go to heaven and who's going to be there and who's not going to be there? Uh, you know, it, it's, I don't know how you could get any clearer than that. Have you ever heard, uh, okay, one that doesn't reproach others, verse 3, reproach, defame, or slander. Verse 4, or the fourth part, one who hates evil but loves righteousness in verse 4. He says, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. One who hates evil but loves righteousness. He whose eyes, he whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. Matthew 6, 33 talks about uh, righteousness and seeking righteousness. He hates this person, hates evil, and loves righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Uh, these are just what David is listing out here, a, a few of the things that a person needs to be, needs to do, if he or she is going to spend eternity in heaven. And one who doesn't increase in wealth at the expense of others, verse 5. He who does not put out his money to usury, nor does he take a bribe against the neighbor. He who does these things shall never be moved. So, who then will be in heaven? Only those who walk uprightly, do the works of righteousness, speak truthfully, and don't backbite uh, or do evil to their neighbor. Those that do these things will be, those that do the right part of this, not the, not the negative part, but the positive part, will be ones who will spend eternity with, with God in heaven. You know, I'm thankful that even though we stumble a lot of times, have you, have you ever committed any of these sins? Boy, we all have, haven't we? We would be, we would be lying if we said no, we hadn't. We've all committed these sins. But you know what I, what I thank God for? There's forgiveness. When we ask God for forgiveness and we repent of that sin, God's more than willing to forgive us. He doesn't say, well, you know, you gotta, you got to prove yourself first. You know, I think of sometimes when somebody, well, one illustration, and I don't remember all the details of it, but a church treasurer that stole money. And, uh, you know, Oh, hey, we have we have one of those here, don't we? Yeah, anyway, uh, you know, you don't, even though they repent, you don't put them right back in to that position. You let them prove themselves first, and and uh, I believe we need to do that as well too. But I'm I'm glad that God doesn't hold it against us. He's willing to forgive us if we're willing to ask Him to do. So the question is, are you going to be in heaven? You're the only one that can answer that question. I can't answer it for you. You can't answer it for me. But uh, each one of us has to answer that question for ourselves. If our life was evaluated solely on what others saw you do and heard you say, 
Would you be spending eternity there? Not what you think, but what others heard, saw you do, and heard you say. Uh, well, I hope to see you there. And I, I'm sure you hope to be there as well, too. But unless you do the things that we talked about last week with regard to repenting and accepting Christ as your Savior and the work that he did on the cross, you're not going to get to be there. But you can be there, and I hope you will be there, and I hope to see you there. And I hope you hope to, to see each other there as well, too. Not just uh, how sad if we don't get there simply because we don't want to... Can I say, play the game God's way? I don't know if that's a very correct way of saying it. But if we want to do what God wants us to do, we're not going to make it. And God's not, you know, teachers used to grade when I was in, when I was in grade school and high school. It was 90 to 100 was an A. 80 to 90 was a B. Some of you old folks remember this. And uh, 60 to 70 was a C. And nowadays... You know, if you get 25, yeah, that's good enough. We'll uh, we'll let you in that way. That's not God. That's not the way God works. His standard never changes. It's always the same. And we have to play the game His way, or we don't make it. And I trust that you're playing the game His way. That you look to Him for help, for strength, to do the things that He wants for each one of us, me included, each one of us to do. None of us are perfect. And uh, we all need help. And so, uh, and I'm glad it's because of what he did there for us on the cross, that he came down here. He knew we were sinners, and he knew that he needed to come down here and save our sins to shed his blood for us so that we might have eternal life. The rest of it's up to us. He did his part. Now we have to do ours. So I just encourage you to, to think about these things, and whether you'll be there or not, uh, you know, I suspect we probably will all be there, but I uh, can't say that for sure. And if there's a question in your mind whether you'll be there or not, let us know. We can talk about it. And that person doesn't have to be embarrassed because, you know, I don't know if I'm going to heaven or not. There's an awful lot of people that say that. I don't know. I'm a good person, and I try to do what's right, but uh, according to what God lays out in his word, we may or may not make it, so... Be thankful that he's provided a means of salvation for us. So, guys, let's go.